My name is Kelly M. And you're on the common surface. And we are blessed to have Dr. Joseph P. Farrell with us today. Dr. Farrell has a degree in patristics from the University of Oxford and several other degrees in addition to that. Uh, and he's the author of, I think, what is it, 37 or 38 books on alternative history, science, philosophy, and culture. Uh, and uh, we are really honored to have uh, Dr. Farrell on the common surface. And uh, so uh, he's already on the line. So uh, why don't you say hello, Joseph? Well, thanks for having me on, Kelly. I'm, I'm glad to be here. So, Joseph, uh, you, uh, you, you wrote uh, the Giza Death Star in 2000 and 2001. Is that correct? That, yeah, it was, um, it was my first foray into alternative research. But I should point out something that uh, most people don't know unless they've read the introduction to that book very carefully. I originally wrote that book and sent it off to a different publisher than the one that eventually ended up publishing it. Uh, the one that ended up publishing it was, was Adventures Unlimited Press. And in that initial book, a lot of the information that made it into the book that was published did not appear. And some information that is not in the published book did appear. <laughs> so, wow. How did that all happen? Well, I, well, there, there was an epigraph. You know me. I like epigraphs in my, in my <laughs> yeah. chapters. Right. So there was an epigraph that I had included in the very original version of the book. And the publisher that I sent it to rejected it. And good thing they did, because I decided that that aspect of the weapon hypothesis that was hinted at in that epigraph was just too sensational, too wild. And at that time, there was not enough good material out there to argue that part of the case. Now, what I'm suggesting here is that that my argument that the Great Pyramid is a weapon does not depend, please understand this, does not depend on that missing material. What does happen when you incorporate that missing material, which I did reincorporate it in the Fourth Pyramid book, which is coming out shortly, uh, and the fourth book is kind of a compendium or resume of the first three. Uh, I reincorporated that missing epigraph that I, I dumped 20 years ago. And the reason I reincorporated it is, number one, I want to see if people are really paying attention because I hinted at this aspect of, of things throughout the first three books and then again in my book, The Cosmic War. Uh, I want to see if people are paying attention. And the other reason is I had intended to do a webinar on my website about this other aspect of the weapon hypothesis that's so out there that people wouldn't really think about it too much. But um, I decided that there's enough there probably to do another book, uh, kind of a coffee table book on that particular subject. So that's what I'm doing right now. So bottom line is I, I redid the book when I initially submitted it, cut out a bunch of stuff that I thought was extraneous and included a bunch of stuff, some numbers that I had crunched while waiting to hear from the first publisher. I, I kind of rewrote the book and included all that number crunching. It sounds to me like, you know, there's so much material. I mean, you wrote three books on this one topic. So and now right. a fourth book and maybe a fifth book. So, you know, it, it managing the level of information that you that you collated and, and it developed must have right. been pretty significant. Well, the difficulty I had with those three books was I, I, you know, I complained for years afterward, after they were published, that had I to do them all over again, I would have written them in a very different way. Mm -hmm. um, the difficulty, first of all, is that it's a very complex argument because you're constantly moving back and forth between some very fringe or avant-garde areas of physics and ancient texts. You're, you're constantly moving back and forward between the two. So that's one complex area. And the other, the other thing that I was also trying to get 
accomplished in those first three books was to get people kind of trained to think analogically, to think in a very different way about ancient monuments and about ancient texts. So that was another additional difficulty. And the third and final difficulty was I, I deliberately intended when I did that first book that if it would prove to be successful, that I had follow-up books in mind. In other words, you know, that was intended to be the first in, in a, a series of books. Part of it, and this is something that people will notice immediately when they read the original three, is that I allude very early on to research that the Nazis were doing during World War II and so on, because there are conceptual parallels to some of the physics they were investigating and some of the things that I believe was taking place in the Great Pyramid. So when, when the publisher of the original three books decided to let the copyright, or to, pardon me, to, to let the uh, publishing on them expire and let the copyright revert to me, I decided, well, this is my chance to rewrite those books. And rather than do that, I thought, well, why do that? You know, they're part of the record now. So just just keep them out there and, and republish them, which uh, my friend Walter Bosley has done. And then do a fourth book, which I hope makes the original argument of the, the original three books much clearer. So I, I've done a fourth book. Uh, people have to understand that about half of that book is simply quoting the first three, but doing so in a different order of argument, which I hope makes the argument clearer. And the other half of that book is new information and new material that has appeared since the first three were written. Makes sense. So, so what is the basic... Uh, outline of the weapon it had an energy uh, source mm -hmm. it had uh a configuration of I, I don't know i would say uh harmonics and coefficients of yes. of uh, objects in nature right um did it incorporate uh anything on the human scale like human dna or anything like that well i <laughs> that wow <laughs> That's one of those questions I'm going to table for the moment because when when the fifth book that I'm working on now comes out, I think you'll see the relevance of your question and a slightly different twist to it that I don't want to go into now. Okay. Because the reason why is I want, the first thing I want people to do is get the fourth book, read it, and get get that epigraph that I put originally into the first original book and then subsequently took out. I want people to notice that epigraph and let that epigraph percolate in their thinking for a bit. Now, that said, in my book, The Cosmic War, I point out the possibility, in my opinion, a rather strong possibility, that in terms of that ancient technology, particularly the, the, the ancient technologies of mass destruction, which ancient texts clearly imply existed. My attempt in the cosmic war was to show that that technology very possibly was biometrically activated. So in other words, you had to have either a certain type of retinal scan or even better, you had to have a certain uh, chromosome or genomic sequence present in your DNA for that technology to work, or, or so, magnetic field, or yeah, a mag you know a magnetic field template, something yeah. to make something uh, of a biometric nature to make that technology work. So I do think that that's very feasible. Interesting. So uh, you know what we're kind of hinting around is uh, the template. Mm -hmm. how the how the device was uh 
how the device was templated to go after a certain thing. Uh, can you explain that? A well, bit? well, if you if you're arguing that the Great Pyramid is a weapon, you have to look at at first of all, you have to look at at the structure as a machine. And the first thing that strikes anybody who's who's gone into an in-depth study of the Great Pyramid and all of its dimensions, okay, is that firstly, its system of measures is very, very close to British Imperial. Okay, this is something that has peculiar has been peculiarly noted about it ever since it began to be studied. And the reason why that's significant is that when you when you measure the pyramid in that system of measurement, you're coming up with nearly whole number uh, measures of, of most of the significant dimensions in the structure. Okay. Now, if you if you press this, if you really press the metrology of, of ancient systems of measurement you'll discover that they are astronomically and geodetically based. So in other words, you're already dealing with systems of measures that are designed deliberately to make structures built with them coupled harmonic oscillators. And they're oscillators of the harmonics of local space-time. So in other words, the other thing that strikes people that have studied the pyramid, this, and I have to, you know, I have to go into a bit of a, a tangent here. I'm a, I play the pipe organ and I play the harpsichord. So I grew up playing a musical instrument where you absolutely had to learn the, the harmonic series in order to be able to understand the numbers on organ stops. Okay. So when I started studying the Great Pyramid, Kelly, the first thing that struck me about some of the measures inside the structure is that you're looking at harmonics of, of dimensions. So you'll have a measure of something here that is repeated somewhere else in the structure at either twice the measure or half the measure. So in other words, you're dealing with octave harmonics or fractions thereof. So the whole structure, in other words, looks to me like it's designed to be a, a an oscillator, a coupled harmonic oscillator of a harmonic series, of the harmonic series. So this means very evidently, right out the door, this means that you're dealing with a machine and you're dealing with a machine that is based on harmonics, both as the source of its power and as the output of its power. Mm -hmm. So this is not, you know, if you're thinking of a weapon, this is not a weapon that you point and aim. This is a weapon that you tune to a target. There's your template. Wow. So it, it, in addition to that, it also used... Uh, multiple kinds of uh, harmonic systems at the same yes. time. Yes. So you, you stated in the book that it used gravitational, it used acoustic, and yes. it used electromagnetic. Yes. And when, I, when I say harmonic, what I'm, what I'm trying to suggest to people is that you're dealing with, a, with an oscillator that is designed deliberately to, to be able to oscillate the entire harmonic series spectrum. Now, when, you know, when we think of the harmonic series, we tend to think merely of music, of sound. But when you, when you look at that in terms of the entire harmonic series, you, you're looking at just a very, very narrow part of the spectrum. Just like visible light mm -hmm. is a very, very narrow part of the spectrum of, of electromagnetic waves. Well, the same thing here is, is true of of acoustics you're looking at a very narrow part of of a harmonic series and what i'm suggesting is is that the great pyramid is designed deliberately again to manipulate all types of waves in their harmonic series so it was sort of uh, you would may describe it as polyenergetic yes yeah exactly exactly mm -hmm. It's it's fundamental. It's fundamental output. If you if you look at what, yeah, I have a funny sound for some messages I get. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
if you if you look at the pyramid in um in terms of of the types of waves that it is inputting and outputting you're dealing with longitudinal waves so in other words you're not dealing with hertzian waves you know the the jump rope wave the sine wave and and for people listening the easiest way to understand the difference is a hertzian wave is what you listen to or watch on TV. It's it's the broadcast sine wave. Mm-hmm. So think of two people holding a jump rope between them. And you one person jerks the rope up and down and it creates the sine wave that travels through the rope to the other person. Now in the jerk, most of that energy in the wave is going to be lost in the up and down motion. A longitudinal wave, on the other hand, would be like suspending a yardstick between two people and having one person at the end of the yardstick pulse or push it repeatedly. And most of that energy, if not all of it, gets transmitted through the yardstick to the other person. That's a longitudinal wave. A longitudinal wave is like a sound wave. It's a wave of compression and rarefaction. And this is the type of wave that I think you're dealing with in, in the Great Pyramid. This is why it's such a potentially very powerful instrument. Yeah, you can see that uh, same phenomena in how earthquakes unfold because right. you, you have three different kinds of waves. You have the right. P, P wave, S wave, S and wave. Really G waves, right? right? Right, right. So the P wave is a pulse. Right. And then uh, 20, 30 seconds later, you get the S wave. Right. Which is right. a an up and down motion. Right. The seismic, the S wave is, is precisely the jump rope wave. Right. And it travels much lower, slower, and it loses a lot of energy in the process. Well, stop and think of what this translates to in terms of the velocity of light. If, if you're dealing with any electromagnetic phenomena, you're dealing in most cases with phenomena that are sine waves. They're, they're, S, their S waves, and they're traveling at the velocity of light. A longitudinal wave, by contrast, has the potential of traveling much, much faster than the velocity of light. In other words, let, let's put this in, in terms that people will more easily and readily understand. Every time you, you use the word space warp you know nasa is investigating right now the idea that we're going to create a warp drive in a hundred years and of course warp drive would allow you quote unquote to travel and i'm putting that whole thing in quotation marks faster than the velocity of light by means of a space warp well a space warp is just another way of saying a compressional wave of compression and rarefaction in the medium so in other words what i'm what i'm saying here is you're dealing with a technology that is fundamentally based on this idea of a warp in the lattice structure of space-time itself it effectively creates a sled where the ship isn't really moving inside the sled right yeah right it's like it's like three people on a toboggan right exactly you it's like a surfer surfing a wave in the ocean the surfer is just sitting there on his surfboard and it's the wave that's pushing him mm-hmm. and that wave of course is a, a compressional uh, wave of, of compression and rarefaction in the medium although not quite because obviously we're dealing with the with a kind of uh, s wave here but it's the same principle in other words that, that we're talking about what is the surfer you to slow down they go side to side and transfer right ex- right he he right exactly Exactly. So, so we have this system that's polyenergetic and right. it's cohering uh, and conjugating these different w- waveforms, or at least their spheres of action are different depending on whether it's acoustic, you know, which part of the electromagnetic spectrum determines its sort of sphere of action, right? Right, right. I, but my my fundamental thinking, Kelly, is that you're dealing with such a highly unified physics and a and a highly unified technology that what it's actually doing is it's you know and I've used this term very deliberately in those original three books. You're you're literally configuring a kind of electroacoustic wave 
you know, a blend of, of both phenomena, electromagnetic mm -hmm. and acoustic. And this is precisely what I think you're dealing with, with people like Nikola Tesla and his uh, Colorado Springs experiments, and then his subsequent attempt to have an electrical wireless power system, because he's not dealing anymore with standard Hertzian waves. And he himself, if you read his notes carefully, he himself comes to this conclusion. He's discovered a new kind of electrical acoustic wave, and this to him represents the most efficient energy and power source that he can imagine. And incidentally, he goes on to reveal the fact that this could be a tremendously powerful weapon. La Montagne Terrible. Yes, exactly, exactly. And, you know, while we're talking about waves and stuff, I should mention that something very peculiar and interesting is present in the Great Pyramid when you look at it from the standpoint of the measures of its dimensions. If you look at the stone courses of the Great Pyramid, you'll discover a wave form that begins at the bottom in a very low frequency of thickness of the stone courses. And then that way, and again, it's a compressional wave. The thicknesses of the stone courses vary as wow. you go from the bottom to the top, but they vary with increasing frequency as you go towards the top. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's this thing, this, this structure is engineered to the hilt. And this is my fundamental argument for why we're dealing not just with a machine, but we are dealing with a weapon. It's the redundancy and all of the feedback loops in this structure that make it uh, a, an incredible amplifier of those types of wave phenomena. It's just such an intense idea. It makes sense that maybe that's why people didn't grab onto your first three books as well as they did the later ones, because maybe there's a genetic memory of how terrible they were. I, you know, it's funny that you mention that because when I was a kid, and I even mentioned this in, in the first Pyramid book, you know, and in the reprint of it. When I was a kid, my father was an engineer, and my parents played cards every Friday night with another couple in, in my hometown. And the husband in that couple was also an engineer. And in fact, he was an electrical engineer for the local CBS television affiliate and had done work during World War II, top secret work on radar for the British. So, you know, the man, the man was, was an incredibly talented and, and, and bright man. And my father and this guy would sit around, you know, while they're playing cards. And oftentimes they'd talk about engineering and, very often they, they talked about the pyramid. One thing that both of them were agreed upon was this thing was not a tomb. There was just too much engineering in the structure for it to function, you know, as a tomb. And when listening to this, I had the impression that if this is the case, then there's something very creepy about this structure. It The structure never felt good. It never felt all jonkles and daisies to me. Then one year when I was a teenager, my parents used to love to travel and we would travel by car, you know, all over the country. Well, one year we were traveling up in North Dakota, just kind of Northwest of Grand Forks. There's a little town out there called Nakoma. And this is where the, the safeguard anti-ballistic missile system was, was scheduled to, to be built. Nixon, of course, scrubbed it. But they still have the, the phased array radar system there for this system. And if you look at a picture of this phased radar array, what you're looking at is a pyramid with the top lopped off of it. And it was at that point, seeing that thing off in the distance, I thought, oh, wow. Is it possible that the Great Pyramid was actually some sort of military structure? And that kind of cemented the feeling I had that this, you know, that you might be right, that we're dealing with some sort of distant memory of, of something terrible. I certainly feel it in my core as we're talking about this. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's 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 creepy. In fact, I put a picture in in the fourth book. It's, there's a picture of this this installation in the first of the three uh, Giza Death Star books. But I found better pictures of it for the fourth book and and put quite a few pictures of this base in the fourth book. And when you compare, when you just do a qualitative sort of analogical comparison of the Giza compound and this phased radar array in North Dakota, the, the resemblance is, is too palpable to be ignored. It, it's it's self-evident. So so that suggests that the Great Pyramid may have also been a sensing device as well oh, yeah. as an output device. Yeah, something that something that people have to understand is that the Great Pyramid, and I point this out in the three original uh, trilogy of books, and I point it out again in the fourth book. The Great Pyramid, it, it, well, let's go around Harvey's barn a bit. When, when you turn to the Soviet top secret research that was done during the Cold War with pyramids, the Soviets discovered that a sharply inclined pyramid, more or less like an obelisk, could function as a kind of antenna, a broadcast antenna. They discovered that a squat pyramid, in other words, a flattened pyramid that wasn't very high but was spread out, acted like a collector or receiver. And they discovered that the exact difference between the two would be a pyramid that was had faces inclined to approximately 51 degrees. Oh my God. <laughs> or yeah, which is exactly the height of the, the, the inclination of the faces on the great pyramid. And that gives you a ratio of pi divided by two height, uh, height to uh, width of the pyramid, which is exactly the kind of structure that you would build to be an efficient broadcast antenna and an efficient receiver all at the same time. So in other words, whoever built that structure there at Giza knew this. And on top of this, the Great Pyramid is unique. I mean, absolutely sui generis unique of all the pyramidal structures that we know of in the world, in that the four faces that you see visible at Giza now are indented along the apothem. Now, the apothem is the line running down the, the visible face exactly from the apex to the ground in the exact center of each face. So in other words, if the four faces are indented along the apothem, what you really have is eight faces and you've got a slightly parabolic indentation to the structure. Yeah, it's not linear in terms of how it's bowed in. No, it's, it's not actually, at all. Yeah. It's actually curved on the way it, in. It, yeah, you can, you can see this very yeah. clearly in some pictures and even, you know, the French were the first to notice it. Uh, the French that went with Napoleon Bonaparte during his expedition, you can yeah. find, you can find etchings of the great pyramid that clearly show this indentation. And again, I, I, I put that etching in all the books, uh, including this new one, because if you look at the etching, it looks again, creepily and eerily military in its, in, its, uh, in its depiction. So this is the other thing you have to be aware of. The Great Pyramid is an absolutely unique structure in the sense that it looks like it was designed to, to collect or to be a receiver of, of that kind of information. Now, I should, I should qualify this because it was discovered when they finally discovered some of the remaining casing stones at the very base of the Great Pyramid in the 19th century. They discovered that the casing stones were perfectly straightly aligned. So in other words, the, the indentation would not have been visible when the pyramid had its casing stones on it. But, you know, thank goodness in a certain sense that it's it, they're not there because we can see this aspect of the structure. And again, it's once again, it, it's a very deliberate part of the design. 
And, and uh, of course, the limestone that covered it, this polished limestone. Think about the Great Pyramid covered with snow and you get the picture. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. And and that particular limestone is nonlinear material. Is well, the granite and the limestone are nonlinear material, and yes. this is significant because I'm my basic analysis of 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 the pyramid is is and again I'm kind of following the lead here of Christopher Dunn. This was actually his idea that that you're looking at some sort of Tesla system. And the reason that nonlinear material is very important in this system is if you go back to Nikola Tesla's experiments in Colorado Springs with, you know, his, his first experiments towards the wireless beaming of power, what Tesla discovered in his laboratory before he went out to Colorado Springs, this was the discovery that set him off on this, this journey. He discovered that if he pulsed a, a bus bar, quite literally, a, a piece of metal with gobs of direct current high voltage electricity, and at the very instant of the pulse broke the current and then pulsed it again and kept doing this over and over again. He discovered that what happens is that the bus bar sets up momentarily at the very instant the pulse hits the bus bar. It sets up momentarily an infinite resistance. And as a result of that, the electrical pulse does not move through the bar or through the wire. It moves over and around it and there's the beginning of your electroacoustic wave that tesla became preoccupied with for the rest of his life that's the beginning of it and in his colorado springs experiments he discovered that when you multiply the components of the circuit and pulse those components the multiplication of the of the surface area of the circuit actually multiplies and increases the power of the pulse. Well, what does that, uh, you know, for the audience, what does resistance accomplish? Well, in this case, resistance accomplishes the, the change of the current from current like we are used to thinking of it to an electroacoustic compressional wave that's moving over the circuit rather than through it. So what does the circuit become? What resistance accomplishes in this case, in the circuit, is it changes the circuit to a, a geometry, to a waveguide geometry, rather than something that, that current is moving through. So now stop and think of this in terms of the Great Pyramid. Let's go back to nonlinear material. Tesla also subsequently discovered that nonlinear material, in other words, things like rock, <laughs> you know, with, with a slightly linear component, limestone and granite both have what in it? Well, they both have lots of quartz crystals. So on top of all of this, you're getting a, a piezoelectric effect through this electrical pulse. So I'm viewing, I'm viewing the Great Pyramid as a huge nonlinear uh, Tesla, sort of a Tesla coil waveguide for these kinds of electroacoustic pulses. And given the mass of the structure and given the fact that Tesla says, well, if you multiply the components of the circuit that functions as a surface area multiplier for the electrical acoustic pulse stop and consider what the great pyramid is it's a pile of rock with each rock having its own surface and then you add to that all the hundreds of thousands of rocks in the structure then you layer them in a waveguide where the frequency of the thickness of the stone courses increases as you get to the top of the structure, and on and on we could go. What you're dealing with is a structure that looks to me like it was deliberately designed with almost an incredible amount of, of feedback loops within the structure, all designed to amplify that energy so the receiver 
uh, you know, the base part of the pyramid all the way up to where the crown was, the, you know, the, the cap of the pyramid. Right. Se seems like the input device. And the crown itself, the very, very top of the pyramid, was probably the output device. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so, so that receiver has got also got celestial mechanics built into it, quantum yes. mechanics built yes. into it. Yes. So it's receiving all that sensor input from, yes. so, from all those different mechanical systems, dynamic yes. systems, and then amplifying them through the device. Yes. You know, by four and then by, you know, by 16 or whatever the actual number is. And then that's all flowing up to the top of the device where it, it's concentrated yeah. and, and expressed. Yes. And, and I don't get into this in the, in the fourth book. I hint at it in the second and third of the original books. There is in physics something called the finite aperture approximation. Okay. Which is where you have a waveguide that squeezes a wave down quite literally to a needle point. And as a result of that, the wave that emerges on the other side is kind of like it's kind of like the two slit experiment, but without the second slit. <laughs> OK, oh, wow. because because what emerges on the other side, if you pump enough energy through the finite aperture, you get this very strange grid result and you get a longitudinal pulse coming out of that 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 some physicists. Uh, I'm thinking of one physicist in particular in Brazil that some physicists think is by its very nature longitudinal because the grid that the pulse sets up is moving faster than the the sine wave being carried on it. Oh, wow. Yeah, this, it, it, it's just, it's yeah, wow, indeed. So it's just, you know, it's a crazy thing, but you are exactly right. When you look at, and I did this in the fourth book, I took a lot more time in the fourth book than the original first three to deal with certain measures. And I took the King's Chamber and, and parts of the Grand Gallery as, as the basis for this. I just looked at some of the measures and pointed out to people that what you're looking at are exactly what a pipe organist recognizes when they're sitting and looking at the stop jam. Because you're looking at measures that are multiples or divisors of two on the, you know, which is an octave. Mm -hmm. And then you're looking at fractions of that along the, the musical intervals of the fourth, fifth and the third. Right. I mean, you know, you're looking at you're looking at very carefully calculated harmonics. I just had this image in my mind of the Phantom of the Opera operating the pyramid. Well, look at the Grand Gallery. Look at the Grand Gallery for a moment. You know, when I first saw a picture of this thing, when I was a boy, a diagram of it, and, you know, the, the bottom end of the Grand Gallery has this kind of chamber with that had granite plugs in it. And I looked at that, and the, the and I even put this in, in the Pyramid book, one of the mm -hmm. first of the three Pyramid books. When you look at the Grand Gallery and compare it to a wooden organ pipe, again, the resemblance is all too palpable. No, it's the, obvious. Yeah, it's, it's rather obvious. So in other words, you've got this enormous organ pipe <laughs> wow. in, in the middle of the structure. And what's it doing? Well, it's generating extremely low-frequency waves. You know, we're talking about, you know, we're talking about an organ pipe. You know, some pipe organs are at the very, very limit, low end limit, or for that matter, upper end limit. But, you know, the longer the pipe, the lower the frequency. So you're dealing with organ pipes on a pipe organ that, that literally are at the very bottom end of, of the range of human hearing. Well, a, an organ pipe that long is going to be absolutely beyond human hearing. It's going to be in, in the ultrasonic and infrasonic range of, of human hearing so again you're dealing with a harmonic structure a harmonic device here and let's add one final thing here kelly and i know i'm i'm just throwing a lot of stuff out there for people but i i'm doing so because i want people to understand that this is not a structure that you would typically build to bury anybody. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, yeah. like Lord Lord Jonkel and Lady Daisy. Yeah, Lord Jonkel and Lady Daisy are, you know, you're going to spend 
you know, the Egyptian equivalent of billions of dollars. How, how do you depict <laughs> Wurlitzer in hieroglyphics? Yes, exactly. You know, what what is what's what's the hieroglyphic for this, you know? And and this is my point. You you're you're asking the impossible. You're 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 machining this thing to an extraordinary degree of mathematical and physics precision, all to bury a pharaoh. And on top yeah. of this, you're you're accomplishing this feat with you know the standard Egyptological toolbox of copper saws, diorite slurry. Yeah. No, no. Sorry yeah, and of for course. <laughs> And of course, yeah, of course, uh, you know, Napoleon using it as an Airbnb. Well, Napoleon, Napoleon is an interesting, let's get back to him, but let me, let me finish by mentioning yeah. what I also wanted to mention in respect to all of this. The Great Pyramid is constantly moving. And most people don't know this. And the reason it's constantly moving is that unlike most buildings at that time, including the other structures at Giza, the Great Pyramid is deliberately designed to move. The reason why is it's sitting on four sockets at each of its corners. And those sockets, if you examine them carefully, are like ball and socket joints. Oh, wow. So in other words, even the slightest tremor in the mantle or crust of the earth makes that building quiver. Wow. constantly like the opposite of what you would do with a phonograph turntable exactly exactly it's constantly quivering that means all those tiny little quartz crystals embedded in its granite and its limestone are constantly under uh piezoelectric photonic and phononic stress wow this is why i think some people that are in and around Giza at night have have often remarked about the fact that the pyramid appears to be sheathed in, on certain occasions in a kind of pale blue light because oh, wow. quite literally it's giving that it's giving it off quite That's literally. A, a plasma like like a right Tarankov radiation. Right. It's, yes, exactly. And you know, Chris Dunn maintained that there was hydrogen gas inside the pyramid and and i'm of the belief that probably if that's the case then it's that that hydrogen is in an endothermic plasma state a cold plasma state which given the the piezoelectric properties of the structure might even be inducing a plasma pinch effect wow. so in other words this thing is folks this thing is engineered to the hilt and, and it's, the, it's still operating at a low level. It's like on standby. And, right, right, right. There are there are elements and components in the structure that are that are clearly missing from the structure now mm -hmm. that used to be there. This is very very clear. You mentioned sapphires in the book. Yes. Well, let's let's talk about this idea of missing components. Um, this is this is a crucial part of the thesis of Christopher Dunn and his power plant hypothesis. It's also a crucial component of Zechariah Sitchin's textual reconstruction of what he calls the Pyramid Wars, because he, on the basis of texts, maintains that there were items in the Grand Gallery, particularly, that were removed at some point. Now, I tend to think that this is absolutely true, because if you look inside the Grand Gallery, which is that long organ pipe structure that we talked about earlier, on each side of, a, of the ledge in the Grand Gallery, there are 27 slots equidistantly placed as you go from the bottom to the top of, of this long chamber. And it's very clear that these slots were designed to hold something. In Chris Dunn's reconstruction, he believes that these slots held banks of Helmholtz resonators, which again stresses the acoustic properties and the harmonic properties of the entire structure. So, so what does a Helmholtz uh, look like? Well, a Helmholtz resonator is like a big... Uh, globe okay like a, a hollow globe 
with a little hole cut in the side of it to allow air current to move over the globe. And as current moves over the globe, the globe will quiver and produce a sound in a specific frequency. Oh, wow. Okay? Kind of like an organ pipe, but spherical. Kind of like, like an organ pipe, but spherical. Right. So Chris Dunn believes that there were 27 banks of these Helmholtz resonators in these slots that ascended up the Grand Gallery, and each bank of resonators had, guess what, had seven Helmholtz resonators from low end to high end. And if you look at that from a certain standpoint, you're, you're dealing, and I think he did that very deliberately. Uh, you know, I've known and, and met Mr. Dunn, and he doesn't do anything hit or miss. <laughs> Okay, so, but he he never talked about why seven. Well, seven is the number of, of tones in, in the musical scale. Oh, wow. At that particular point in history. So as you're going up the Grand Gallery, what you're really dealing with are different banks of Helmholtz resonators that are the equivalent of, the, of, of equal tempering, in my opinion. Now, in my thinking... I I did not throw out uh, Dunn's idea of acoustic resonators, but I wanted those resonators to be optical as well as acoustic. Mm -hmm. So in my original book, I posited that what you had in these resonator arrays were what I called phi crystals. <laughs> And the reason I call them that is, be, and I was speculating wildly here at mm -hmm. this point, but it, it seemed to be necessary because of the way that the structure and the harmonics in the dimensional analogs were, were pointing me. And that is that a certain kind of crystal might be constructed whose index of refraction was so designed to be able to literally entrap light inside of it. In like the words, crystal skulls. Like the crystal skulls, but to do so in a much more efficient manner. In other words, the crystal actually functions as a kind of singularity. Wow. Trapping light within it. And the acoustic part of it would be the way that the, the, uh, that the, the boundary layer would be pierced or or activated so in other words i i speculated wildly that that you had some sort of uh so that would be photonic energy trapped inside those uh like crystal helmholtz generators right right yeah you'd have a mini singularity quite literally wow and of course once you start talking about that then you're starting to talk about gravity pace einstein mm -hmm. you're starting to talk about time time effects and so on and so forth so if you've got those kinds of metamaterials as as literally gemstones that are, are functioning inside that structure, then you're dealing with, with the thing that really makes the whole thing work. And this is why they're removed. So when I was doing the fourth book, Kelly, I discovered that my my crystal singularity idea somebody out there has actually gone ahead and done it whoa and i thought whoa you know in 20 short years what i thought was a wild specul and i and i'll be honest i i debated a long time whether to incorporate that idea in that original book or not mm -hmm. and i finally did so i'm glad i did because i got out of the gate early on that one and but, it seems analogically related to the recent articles that have come out on scientific experiments uh, about time crystals as well right time crystals uh there there are other properties uh metacrystal properties that that are very unique that i talk about in this uh upcoming fourth book but you're exactly right they, they're they're experimenting with crystals as a way to create little time bubbles and remove and this is to me very interesting to remove events from the cause effect stream yeah well, at some point, if that bubble breaks down, what do you have? You have an ev event that will re-enter the cause-effect stream. Right. And well, could, 
could re-enter it, you know, much, much later, or even for that matter, earlier, you know. Yeah, and you know, since hydrogen was a key part of the operating, of, you know, part of the uh, the power generation uh, mm -hmm. of the device, mm -hmm. uh, what what relationship does that have to the Harvard experiment on metallic hydrogen? Oh, I, wow! I didn't <laughs> I didn't anticipate that one. Uh, I I tend to think probably a tremendous relationship, although. Um, my suspicion is that that we're missing something inside the pyramid. And since you asked that question, I'm going to uh, you're, you're getting me to talk about things I have not talked about before. And okay. I haven't talked about them because some ideas are just too wild and willy. But I'm going to go ahead and take the plunge off the end of the twig. <laughs> um, I sus do you know what a diamond anvil press is? Yeah, it's a it's a diamond that uh, or two diamonds right. that that are focused on a point. Like the pyramid focuses up, right. these things point down to each other, and it apparently creates millions of atmospheres of of right. Uh, rarefaction. Right. Well, the Harvard experiment, if I recall, was using a diamond anvil press to create a metallic version of hydrogen. Right. In other words, they needed pressures of of millions of atmospheres uh interestingly enough kelly and i know that you're going to drop your jaw when you hear this one and i by the way i do talk about the diamond anvil press in the fourth book okay oh, so yeah. so you've anticipated something that um but interestingly enough guess where they did a lot of this high pressure research where in the 1950s <laughs> at Fort Monmouth. Oh, wow. And that, that's close to home. And there's an interesting person involved in some of that research. And, and I will, I, I'm not going to say, you'll just have to look, <laughs> you'll just have to look at the picture in the new book. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, I, I grew up uh, 10 miles from Fort Monmouth. So I know you did. Yeah. And, and I know that you've read the McCarthy book so that you know the significance of, of Fort Monmouth appearing yet again. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. <laughs> but here, but what I'm getting at here is it's, it's been my suspicion for a while that there is some aspect of the Great Pyramid that we're still missing. And that aspect may be that at some point in the structure and probably my guess would probably be in the king's chamber somewhere that at some point in the structure you were also reliant upon something producing extremely high pressure like a diamond anvil press would produce wow You know, the number 27 is interesting for another mm -hmm. reason, because I, I recall that uh, quantum mechanical superposition has 27 eigenstates. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's no doubt in my mind that there are aspects of that are, how to put it, that, that they knew aspects of quantum mechanics that, that only were discovered millennia after this structure was built, supposedly discovered. Wow, the uh, baby well, is in the bathwater. The baby is in the bathwater. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, you, you can you can find all sorts of. The problem is, you can find all sorts of physical constants in the Great Pyramid. You can find dimensional analogs of the coefficients of various physical constants, and the problem is, you can do so over and over again. So in other words, this is not a this is not a statistical anomaly. These people knew something. Yeah. And much more interestingly, you can often find harmonics of those coefficients of the physical. Oh, that's constant. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and you know, I'm convinced that they knew the fine structure constant in its fractional version. You know, wow. one over one over one, one by by one thirty seven. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, looking at this structure, you just have to be in awe. And you would you also have to be in awe that anybody who knows all of this would propose with a straight face. 
that this was intended as a tomb for a pharaoh who by all Egypt, <laughs> yeah. by all egyptological accounts never even occupied it <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know it doesn't strike me as the most uh, comfortable accommodations in this life or the next no i mean you know <laughs> Yeah, you can just you can just see poor Napoleon Bonaparte crawling his way up to the king's chamber to spend the night in the sarcophagus. You know? Yeah, you know, which I don't put past him. I, you know, I happen to think that 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 whole story is true because yeah. that's that's just something Bonaparte would do. But Did, didn't Plato spend time in the pyramid? Uh I am not. I'm not sure. I don't know. I've never heard that before. But there are a bunch of. Let's put it this way. Plato did say that that he was initiated into the Atlanta story by his uncle, who was in turn initiated by Egyptian priests. So there's some there's some Egypt connection to Plato that's very weird. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, scholars need to do a, a deep dive on on that one, which they have not done. I wonder if you could find it by decoding some of his writings in their original language. Well, the decoding, as I point out in, in another of my books, Microcosm and Medium, Plato's dialogues are shot through with coded music theory. Wow. Oh, yeah. The, the Republic is, is one such encoded piece of, of work. Wow. Uh, because if you read the Republic from the standpoint of music theory, you end up with something very, very interesting. Huh. Because so, remember, remember, Atlantis was the perfect metric society. It was all based on tens. Wow. But it fell apart. Athens was based on twelves. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So so you have the imperial system yep. and you have the metric system. Yep. And it, it strikes me that the metric system's purpose is to obscure physical relationships as opposed to pointing them out. Oh, I... I Oh, Kelly. Yeah, I I am not only in agreement with you, but I've been four square in that camp ever since I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, I, I absolutely, I do not use and will not use metric. Let's just put it that way. Uh, because if you, if you look at, if you look at the English imperial system of measure, or for that matter, go back and look at the ancient Sumerian system of measure. Right. You're dealing with what at first appears just to be a hodgepodge of <laughs> ar arbitrarily assigned units and values. But when you dig into their astronomical and geodetic basis, what you end up with is something very different. Right. And, and the metric system, you know, it does have a geodetic basis, but that basis is, is one leg of the stool. In other words, the English imperial system is a three-legged stool. The French metric system is a one-legged stool. <laughs> I think the English would probably hold that opinion anyway. Well, yes. <laughs> yeah. that, <laughs> that goes without saying. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, even even Bonaparte was Italian. So, yeah. right. <laughs> That's amazing. So, you know, so what about the United States decision to not to you know, that we had that whole thing during Carter mm -hmm. and into the beginning of the Reagan administration about the move to metric. Right. And then all of a sudden it stopped and nobody mentioned it again. Well, I, you know, I, I do think that the, there's something going on with metric and, and why that whole thing stopped, I don't know. Um, they said if, it was retooling costs. Like, Well, that, that would be a problem because you'd have to redo everything. You yeah. know, um, your manufacturing base becomes instantly obsolete. Well, the the problem, you know, if you look at the American military, if you look at the U.S. Army, uh, it has always since World War One, it has used uh, the French metric system as a means of calibration of artillery pieces and so on. But that's simply because in World War One, we we took over a lot of French designs for our artillery. Yeah. 
And so they were the experts. Well, they were the experts, you know, and and this is the reason that to this day our, our principal heavy artillery is a 155 millimeter howitzer. That was the, the caliber that the French used. Wow. And on and on it goes. But in terms of in terms of the metric system at large, I rather suspect that uh, had Thomas Jefferson been alive during that <laughs> metric debate, he would have pitched a hissy fit. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that whole Sumerian, you know, you have base 10 at the metric yes. system and you sort of have base 12, which I believe was, you know, what base, what base is the English Imperial? Is it base 12? Is it base? Well, it's, the... it's, it's the, the measure system is base 12. Yeah. But, but that's also because there's a harmonic basis for that. The keyboard, a, a music keyboard, has what? It has 11 notes, and then the 12th note is the octave. Right. Imagine that keyboard with 10. <laughs> it would sound horribly out of tune to us. Oh, interesting. It would also sound like a Berlin disco. Yeah, well, it would, you know, it, it would be Arnold Schoenberg on steroids. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. so... Uh, it, there you read Plato's Republic and this is what he's getting at is and he will use these words about the 12 system of Athens that this was the system that established equilibrium and harmony wow so in other words Plato's telling you that they know all about the equal tempering system of music and, long and, before it ever becomes applied broadly to musical instruments yeah and Archimedes was not a Spartan and our, well, <laughs> you know, my point here is they know all of this stuff and they keep it a secret because there are physics implications to it. Right. And now the Sumerian system was base 60, right? Yeah, the Sumerian system is base 60, but what's 12? Yeah, so it's 12 a fraction is a of 60. Wait, wait, you're missing the music. 12 is divided into 60 how many times? Five. Oh, five. Sorry. <laughs> so, so you're, you're dealing with what? With twelve? You're dealing with a fifth. Oh my God! So your A to E or G right, to C. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. You're dealing with the first differing overtone to the fundamental in any harmonic series with any fundamental. So, so then you know you go from base twelve to base sixty, right? Right. And base sixty is interesting. Base twelve, you know, let's say that there's an analogical relationship or direct harmonic relationship between base twelve and base sixty, right? So then you also include circular uh, calculations. Right. 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 It's you know again, what is what do you learn in music theory right off the bat? You learn the circle of fifths and fourths. Right. 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 And so you, you, you basically have all of the, you know, you have a lot of complexity down at the, the one eighth and one sixteenth of an inch and Bingo. pint and all that. You have a lot of complexity on the surface. Bingo. But when you get into it, you have this fantastic unified intention of symbol yes. going on in the mathematics. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. This is why, you know, again, Isaac Newton, uh, spent a lot of time studying the measures of the Great Pyramid because in his mind, he needed those measures to complete his theory of gravity and, and to, make the, to make the numbers elegant. And by the same token, you know, we mentioned Thomas Jefferson earlier. Well, Jefferson was one of these people that believed that the British imperial system was a very, very ancient system of measurement mm -hmm. and that it was geodetically based. So, but it wasn't just geodetically. I think it also had a relationship to some solar system. Oh, well, yes. It's there's also uh, ancient systems of measure. Let's let's just cut to the chase. Ancient systems of measure are primarily geodetic and astronomical. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they are not going to vary that much over long spans of time. <laughs> yeah. Pure and simple. Yeah. This this. This happy horse pucky that they teach in the American <laughs> that they teach in the American Quackademy mm -hmm. that all of these ancient systems are based on measurements of of body, the human body and its limbs, you know, nonsense, yeah. nonsense. So we have Egyptology, which is you know, you know, you know, it seems like it's designed to promote the tourist business more than explain anything. Yes. And also to obscure uh, the actual 
you know, uh, meaning of Egypt right. of, uh, and Cairo, uh -huh. yeah. right? And you have the metric system, which is designed to obscure the, yeah. the, you know, the fantastic set of harmonic mathematical relationships uh, in base 12 and base 60. Right. And, and you have the repression of physics starting with James Clark Maxwell. Yep. Uh, oh, yeah. Right. And also the suppression of Tesla, quite frankly. I mean, yep. he was, you know, they basically had him in an open air prison in New York. Yeah. 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 You know, and so there's a lot of, uh, there's, you know, and I, you know, if I was in their shoes, you know, they corporation, if I was in their shoes, I'd probably want to suppress some of this stuff too. Well, the, the standard argument given for why JP Morgan pulled the financial plug on Tesla's wireless power idea. The standard explanation was that Morgan pulled the financial plug because he couldn't need her Tesla's system. That's yeah, bullshit. <laughs> and it is complete BS because yeah. he stood to gain an enormous fortune of money yeah. off the licensing agreements of the appliances that would have used that system. Right. And probably a lot more money than than metering, you know, the electric wire coming into homes, on the uh, on the polyphase alter, alternating current system. Now, now Tunguska was in 1908, I believe, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, and so yeah, Morgan had the benefit of understanding 1908. Right. When it practically broke windows in Moscow. That that blast. Yes. 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 And how far well, how far was that from Moscow? Like eight eight hundred miles? Oh, much more than that. Oh yeah, much more than that. No, the problem. The problem. I was getting to this. The problem right. with Morgan pulling the plug on Tesla is, I think it that he either understood, or that someone told him. And if it was someone, my guess would be Charles Steinmetz, uh, Tesla's Tesla's equally smart assistant. Okay. Uh, that someone told Morgan that, you know, you got to be careful of this guy. This thing can be converted into a weapon very easily. And you're helping fund this man in his quest for power. Um, I, I really do think that something like that is, is really behind him pulling the plug. Once the system is built, then you've got a system of that's capable in its weaponization of an extraordinary amount of power. Um, you know, you're using, you're literally using the planet earth in that system wow. as your antenna and your battery and your battery. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, this, this is a very, very dangerous system to play around with. And this is, this is what has always dogged my weapon hypothesis idea of the great pyramid. I always run into these people that want to go back to the jonquils and daisies narrative and say, well, couldn't it have been built or intended when it was built as nothing but a power plant and that was subsequently used as a weapon? And my answer is always no, because the very nature of the physics and science that seems to be implied in the structure means that that weaponization potential is there from the start, just like it is in Tesla's system. Wow. You know, based on the books, which I've read all of them, yeah, except the new one, and based on, you know, our discussion today, I mean, there's no question that, you know, the ludicrousness of those people who think that, you know, you know, uh, that, you know, we're all going to be holding hands and singing Kumbaya around the <laughs> Great Pyramid or just, you know, it's ludicrous. It is ludicrous because let let's... Let's look at that a minute. If, if you look at the Great Pyramid, the thing that convinced me more than anything else that you're, that you're looking at the shell of a weapon is that if you look at it from a purely architectural point of view, that structure is a hardened structure. And by hardened, I mean hardened in the military sense. Well, first of all, it's still there. It's, yeah, after after millennia, it is still there. 
Yeah, or maybe longer. Or it, probably, yeah, probably longer. I, you know, I don't think that the thing is an Egyptian structure at all. I think, <laughs> no. it's, you know, I think it's much, much older than that. Yeah. Um, you know, the inscriptions that they, the Egyptologists say that uh, point to this thing as having been built by the Pharaoh Khufu. Well, the problem is the, <laughs> the, the only inscriptions that attribute the structure to Khufu were found in the relieving chambers above the king's chamber by a British colonel in the 19th century by the name of Howard Weiss. And there has always been a suspicion. The suspicion began with Zechariah Sitchin. You know, once again, Sitchin, whatever you say about his, his macro scenario, and I think his macro scenario is absolutely barmy, <laughs> to be honest with you. But the detailed elements of his of his scenario are oftentimes right on. And it was Sitchin that first suspected that Vice's so-called discovery was a forgery. Okay. In between well, didn't the they dy didn't they dynamite to get to that as well? Yes, he dynamited it through the through the pyramid to get up into those relieving chambers, so-called relieving chambers. Relieving chambers. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's just such <laughs> it's just such nonsense that they come up with. Wow. But but in the process of dynamiting his way into those chambers, oh lo and behold. The inscriptions were on all the walls that he hadn't dynamited. Yeah, through. Kilroy was here. Yeah, Kilroy was here, you know. And there's always been a suspicion that that he forged these these inscriptions. Well, I can tell you this, Kelly, when I published the original three books, the the argument that it was a forgery had advanced as far as Alan Alford. And Alford was missing a key component of his argument, and that, and so was Sitchin, for that matter, and that was Colonel Vice's private notes. And what did they say? They weren't even found until a couple of years ago. Oh yeah, found. Found. Yes. They blow the dust off. Well, <laughs> what they what they show is. Clearly, and again, this will be in the fourth book, clearly and unequivocally beyond any shadow of a doubt that those inscriptions were forged by Colonel Weiss. Oh, wow. Now, with that, the, the sole solid piece of unequivocal evidence tying the Great Pyramid to the Pharaoh Khufu or the Pharaoh Cheops <laughs> has utterly been blown away. Wow. If well, anything, what Khufu did is he came on to the plateau and expropriated, you know, in the classic case of, of cultural expropriation, appropriated the pyramid to himself. But someone else built it. Now, when that thing was covered in limestone, I mean, how long would a structure like that last? I mean, how, how quickly would it get weathered? Oh, an enormous amount of time, depending upon the condition of, of the weather at, at the time. Right. Now, the, here's the problem. <laughs> yeah. the, the Great Sphinx has been <laughs> redated by, by Robert Schock uh, when it was, it was actually um, Schwaller de Lubitsch, the, the esoteric right. Egyptologist, that noticed that the Sphinx when you uncovered the body, showed massive signs of water erosion. And this was noticed by John Anthony West, who published this, this point in his book, uh, The Serpent in the Sky. And then Dr. Robert Schock, a geologist, actually was paid money to go over and examine the, the Sphinx for himself. And Schock did so and came to the conclusion that the Sphinx showed clear signs of enormous amounts of water erosion, which would mean that it dates to the subpluvial period in, in ancient Egyptian history, which would date it to no later than 8,000 B.C. 
Wow, because that, that, you know, that kind of gets into the recovery from the Younger Dryas. Well, the problem there is 8,000 BC is about 4,000 years before the beginning of dynastic Egypt. Yeah. In other words, we're not dealing with ancient Egypt with the Sphinx. Yeah, we're not. We're not. And that means that if the Great Pyramid was once covered with limestone, and if Cheops or Khufu is not the one who built it, mm -hmm. but rather who appropriated an already existing structure, then either the, the casing stones on the Great Pyramid were not subjected to that type of weathering, or the polishing did something to them to harden them against that kind of water erosion. And the reason I say that is that in the fourth book, I include the epigraph from an Arabic source hmm. that mentions that in their lore, the water line of the flood could be observed on the casing stones of the Great Pyramid about halfway up the structure. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 You can imagine, you know, it, you know, they say it was polished, but it also could have been, you know, hardened like an alloy. Right. Right. Now, I don't know if anybody has taken the remaining casing stones uh, of the Great Pyramid and done that sort of chemical analysis to see if the surface uh, of those casing stones is showing evidence of some sort of hardening. So I don't know. I'm I'm speculating wildly at this point. Or or yeah, and the way maybe the way it was prepared. I mean, we learned very recently how the Romans made concrete that lasted you know two thousand years. Right, right. And they apparently there was a heating or tempering process when the when it was being formed that kept some of the limestone powder you know, you know, latticed within the concrete. Yep. And, and then, you know, when you have an earthquake or something or water penetrates in, it reconcretes up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't doubt it. And, yeah. and, and heating makes a great deal of sense. Uh, you know, it's something given, given the other components of the structure and the fact that you are dealing with, with hydrogen in a sort of endothermic, plasma state inside the structure some sort of of strengthening by that kind of uh, heat tempering would would seem to me to be indicated in the structure there's there's so much about this structure that we don't know yeah but i i do think it's safe to say that if you look at if you look at the architecture if you look at the kind of physics that seems to be implied in that architecture on the one hand, and then tie it with the textual indications that, that in particular, Sitchin connected to the Great Pyramid, you get a very, very interesting and, and in my opinion, creepy picture. Yeah, it's very unsettling, I have to say. It's very unsettling, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, back to measurement for a second, because, uh, you know, we talk a little bit about uh, you know, units of measure and mm -hmm. and things like that. You know, there's also the measurement of time, right? And I know yes. that there's a lot of controversy around, you know, there's just chronological, you know, flies in the ointment everywhere. It's a very ugly ointment at this point. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so we have, uh, you know, Dr. Tom Van Flandern's Missing Planets book. Yes. Right, which, uh, you know, which described you know using supercomputers to run back the clock right on where celestial bodies were you know uh, millions and millions of years ago it must have taken right. a really long time for the crate to pump that one out right right and you have you know long period comets and you have all this other stuff going on and you know van flander you know said 65 million years mm -hmm. ago for the destruction of the the, the, the saturn's mass planet mm -hmm. uh, near jupiter between what is now mars and jupiter mm -hmm. and you had him later on saying well the dates also work out for three million or so 3.2 million yeah 3.2 million which is suspiciously close to when lucy shows up in the uh, fossil record yes uh and then uh you you have uh, you know dates that are closer in uh you know 650,000 i think has been mentioned 
Well, Dr. Mark Carlotto mentioned that date as the date of the destruction of Mars based on celestial alignments of certain things at Sedonia. Wow, that's interesting. So that's, that's Dr. Mark Carlotto's date. Now we have interesting, you know. Let's let's assume that Van Flandern is correct, mm -hmm. and uh, you know he he later on in his life he died in two thousand four. Mm -hmm. He later on in life uh, gave a talk, and he, he had decided on the three million three point two million number. Right. You mm -hmm. know he, he you know he got rid of the dinosaur date. You know the mm -hmm. the Chicxulub date. <laughs> you know and uh, decided on the three point two million date. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about you know. If you're going to take the, uh, you know, great pyramid type weapon, whether it's the one floating around Saturn or the one that's uh, present in G the Giza compound, mm -hmm. and you're going to, you know, pump that thing up and you're going to blow up a planet, right? You have uh, a system that's designed to create uh, certain cohered resonances of yes. various types, right? Right. So that if you're if you're turning that thing on a planet and you're pumping energy scalar energy into that planet mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right you but the planet isn't uniform it's not all made of the same substance right so you're you're probably going to target the mantle or maybe the core right you know and the core and earth is iron but the mantle's a whole bunch of stuff right 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 so you're going to get different effects in different aspects of the planetary structure yep. from the inputting of that scalar uh, energy right right and so when when you know, like if you look at the remnants that are in the asteroid belt mm -hmm. there's like f f five or six major pieces mm -hmm. the biggest one of course is series right mm -hmm. and if you do spectral analysis of series you find basically carboniferous fossils right coming back you find water coming back like 62 percent of it is 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 saline is salt water mm -hmm. and then you have uh you know uh, sort of a clay a lot of clay is in there as well so what you have basically there assuming van flanders is correct mm -hmm. basically there you have uh, a, a chunk of the ocean and the ocean floor right right yeah. and so you know with that in mind you know it takes about a million years for uh, you know for a, a an irregular chunk of that size to become spherical right so we've already pushed past a million years right for the, for that event right right with that so that kind of you know it, we don't know if the great pyramid was used maybe as part of a network to to make that event happen do we no the problem the, here the timing or chron chronological aspect of this is the point that has dogged not just me but all alternative researchers because if you if you look at the, the dating of, of the flood that most people in the alternative community accept as being circa 12,500 to 10,000 BC. Okay. That is obviously not nearly old enough to be reconciled with a 3.2 million years old date for the explosion of Van Flandern's planet. Mm -hmm. And the reason that the explosion of that planet is significant is, as you point out, it most likely was a water-bearing solid planet, mm -hmm. okay, of enormous mass. And if, if it was 3.2 million years ago, then obviously that, ex that exceeds any date that I know of that anyone has proposed for the Great Pyramid. All I have said in that respect is that the the weapon that would have been used to blow up that planet and i do think it was a weapon mm -hmm. because again the texts if you read them that's what they say the weapon that has no equal the weapon that has no equal marduk's thunderbolt whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. i am not one of these people that thinks that th these texts are referring to catastrophes mm -hmm under the metaphor <laughs> of a war. I think they are talking about a real war because even Van Flandern, if you read his, his Dark Matter, Missing Planets, and New Comets book carefully, what he says 
or what what you what you get out of reading between the lines is that he cannot come up with any mechanism that is natural for the spontaneous explosion of a planet. Mm -hmm. That's that's his problem. Right. And at the end of that discussion, he just finally comes out and says, oh, well, maybe it was the result of deliberate action. Yeah, it's kind yeah. of sheepishly thrown in. Yeah, it's just, it's just, you know, it's just kind of sheepishly thrown in. But it, when you read him, you, you get the impression that this is this is the last resort. And he's been trying to avoid that conclusion. Yeah. So my problem is the chronology. Now, I'm not maintaining that the Great Pyramid is 3.2 million years old. I do maintain that it is a heck of a lot older than ancient Egypt. How well, old? No one really knows. Well, isn't the Y chromosome like 455,000 years old? Well, yeah, the Y, the y chromosome of, of human males is older than humanity. I mean, yeah. You know, how does this happen? You Whoops. Know? Whoops, and and by that same token, uh, the the uh, the the mitochondrial DNA in in human females that that all human females share is a little bit younger than humanity is supposed to be. You know, oh my God, on and on we could go. You know, so follow the science, folks. Well, the problem. <laughs> But the problem is the science is leading into nonsensical places. That's well, you know, that gets me kind of to like how we have all the different races on the planet. I mean, one way right, to do exactly. is to take a Star Trek or, you know, original series model where you've got all these different humanoid races that have different characteristics depending on where they come from. And after the, the cosmic war, they got to go somewhere and the Earth was the best place to go. To go, right. Well, let, let's put it differently. Let's put it differently. Where, where is there the best solid evidence for a planetary-wide flood? Mars. Mars. Not here. Mars. Yeah. If anything, if, if, if Mars was once a satellite of a water-bearing planet, and that planet suddenly explodes... Then what happens to Mars? Well, the first thing that happens to Mars is it gets hit, concussed, by a shockwave of water moving through space that is literally going to scour one half of that planet and leave the other half pretty, pretty damaged. And this is exactly what you see on Mars. Yep. The other thing that's going to happen to Mars with that kind of a shockwave is that it's going to be moved or shunted into a very weird orbit. And this is also what you see yeah. with Mars. And then finally, as the shockwave spreads and dissipates, part of that shockwave is probably going to hit the Earth and do significant but not planet-destroying damage. Wow. And that's, that's also what we see. With three hundred foot seas uh, higher than the past, right? Yeah. Well, this is this is our problem, right? You know, we're trying. We're we've got all of these disparate parts of a story that is one unified whole, and the problem of fitting the disparate parts together is the chronological problem. Unless there was more than one event, I mean, that's what it suggests to me. Well, it could be more than one event, and you know humanity being what humanity is you know we like we like repeats you know yeah. world, world war one wasn't good enough so let's fight a bigger and better war you know yeah so, cosmic war the sequel it's cosmic war the sequel yes exactly <laughs> you know some interplanetary germany out there decides well, to go one more time you know tom van flandern in 2003 2004 just before he passed mm -hmm. was giving a talk and he actually described that when when the mass of debris and, and water mm -hmm. hit the face of Mars, mm -hmm. right? Which doesn't explain the scar, which is another thing. Mm -hmm. But when it hit the face of Mars, that it, it rotated seven times. The, he did the computer simulations and it rotated seven times. And then all of a sudden it flipped 90 degrees. Oh, wow. And what you notice about Mars right at the Gale Crater is the, <laughs> is the you know, dividing line of the... Yep, you know, the, all of a sudden you're the one side of Gale Crater. You're at sort of one altitude, 
the sort of the the mean altitude of Mars. And then you at the end of the Gale Crater, you're on the other side, you're up a mile. Yeah. So the entire southern uh, part of Mars is one mile higher yep. than the northern side. Yeah. Which yeah. precisely matches what Ben Flandern said. Yeah. Now I, I happen to think he's he's right and and that if if that happened. I, I do think that there were probably a few survivors, and this is what we see, you know, in the northern hemisphere of Mars, particularly around places like Sedona. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, you see a surviving remnant. So yeah, I you know I have no difficulty with this, and I have no difficulty with the Great Pyramid not being the weapon that did that. However, I want to point out something very significant that I mentioned in my pyramid books, the original three, and mentioned again in the fourth book, for precisely this reason. And that is, in the Edfu temple texts, which are a late set of Egyptian temple texts, they talk in those temple texts about the Zeptepi, or what the, the, the that's the Egyptian term, for the first time and in their recounting of the first time those temple texts do talk about a cosmic war that was brought about by something called the sound eye oh wow there's your electroacoustic wave folks uh oh yeah there it is right there and that this this was brought about by something called the Rostow, which was a mountain in an island. Oh, my God. Now, that, that whole war resulted in the destruction of that Rostow or mountain. And another one was built later. So what I'm suggesting by referring to the temple text is that maybe the Great Pyramid is something that was rebuilt wow. much later than the original version. That makes the metrology a lot easier. That makes the metrology a lot easier. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, this is a speculative case. Of course. But my, but my point is, it does rationalize why you would build something like that again. Because the structure was intended as a, uh, as, as quite literally, a weapon of hegemony, of, of mass destruction. Uh, it's it's the a bomb of its day before the Soviets get it, you know, <laughs> so. or or the cooperation between both governments over time to protect the planet from interlopers. Well, that could be it too, you know. Yeah, there's there's any number of ways to parse this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the the other thing I do think uh, that bears mentioning is I. I have always strongly suspected, and in the fourth book, I just finally come right out and say it, uh, but you'll strongly get this impression from the other three and from the book, The Cosmic War, is that the Great Pyramid fits all of the requirements for the Tower of Babel. I was going to say, I was going to ask you that question. Yeah, yeah. Now, now the confusion of tongues. I mean, if you've got uh, this pyramid and it's operating, and they decide to program it uh, to the human brain resonance cavity, mm -hmm. and people can communicate with each other without talking, mm -hmm. or understand. Yeah, everybody can understand each other, mm -hmm. and maybe that was needed because of all these different uh, survivors that all gathered on the Earth, right? It it could be. It could be. And yeah. you know how how do you how do you fight something like that? Well, you you. It's very interesting here. And this is where Sitchin's, where Sitchin's textual reconstruction runs into a bit of a problem. Because if you read Sitchin's book, The Wars of Gods and Men, that whole book is largely about what he's calling the Pyramid Wars, which were wars fought over and with that structure. Yeah. Now, in, in his reconstruction... And I, I'm accepting his reconstruction simply for the sake of argument. I'm not saying that it's an academically sound argument, because had I written it, I would have done it very differently. Mm -hmm. 
but I am accepting it for the sake of argument. Okay. If you look at the way he reconstructs that war, the war ends with the Great Pyramid being surrendered by one party to the other. Then the, the, immediately an inventory is taken of its contents. That's the epic of Ninurta that I reproduce in, in the Cosmic War. Right. And some of, the con some of the contents are removed from the structure, and I believe that that is referring to what existed in the Grand Gallery and to a much lesser extent in the Queen's Chamber and King's Chamber. And some of those things were called off and carted off and used in other applications. Some of those things were destroyed, and there were a very, very few, like two or three of these things that could not be destroyed that were hidden. Okay. So look what we have. We have a terribly destructive war that leaves the structure intact to have its components inventoried and destroyed. Now, that's a very peculiar war. Sure. You would think that they would have targeted the daylights out of that, that area, whoever was fighting the war. Now... If they if, could. If they could, yeah. That's making the assumption that they could. So I think what you're looking at here is is a bit of a problem that there's something about this structure that makes it itself off limits. I suspect I know what it may be. Hmm. Uh, I suspect it's related to that epigraph that I have restored in the fourth book. Oh, interesting. I yeah. look forward to reading that. That's oh, going to be I'm... out in February, March now? I think, uh, well, David Childers told me that it would be either February or March. It's supposed to be out in his spring catalog, which, you know, once once the catalog arrives in the mail, then, you know, they're going to start getting orders. So that should come out sometime February or March. Now, I believe it's already up on his website. The book is called The Giza Death Star Revisited. And again, I want to, I want to alert people. About half the book is actually simply copy and paste from the original three, but in a very different order and in many cases with a lot of added material. And I, I had to format the book in a special way so that people could see the original material when I was using the original material and when I was adding oftentimes as little as an explanatory word or phrase to that original material. Mm -hmm. So it's that well, we're dealing we're dealing with a perfectly analogical structure. Yes. So you have to imagine that there are multiple ways to approach this topic that just boggle the mind. Oh, yeah, there are. Yeah, it's, it's like, you know, I'm glad you put it that way, because the original the original feeling I had, Kelly, when I was attempting to write these books and, and sketch them out was uh, it was like trying to get on a moving my uh, a, a moving merry go round. <laughs> uh, it, it was it was literally pick a pick a place and, and just dive in. And, you know, I think the reason that the three books were confusing for a lot of people was, number one, that there was so much information, it became information overload. And the other, the other reason was, you know, we're literally diving onto a moving merry-go-round. Yeah. You know, you cannot, I mean, you, I went back and read the first book again, mm -hmm. and, and I saw it in a completely new way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did too, and I hope I hope I've clarified the basic argument of the weapon hypothesis with this fourth book. I think I have. I I think I've I've I think I've hit it. If I haven't hit the nail on the head, I've at least hit it much closer to the head than I did in the original three. But like I say, even even here, there's fifty percent. It's that other fifty percent that I was extremely hesitant to talk about because there simply wasn't enough information out there to do so. Now there just barely is enough information out there on this specific area that I can at least make a speculative coffee table book. 
Now, so. now we have uh, we have two objects in the solar system that have nearly perfect circular orbits within three <laughs> or five degrees, right? Yep, yep. And one of them is our our ugly moon, <laughs> and uh, it really is ugly if you really look at it. Uh, and uh, you know, which it has a lot of titanium on it, uh, orange uh, oxidized titanium. Yeah, was found by a lot of the astronaut missions that went up there. Yep. Uh, which, you know, and it also has that regolith kind of uh, dampening surface. Yep. And then seems to have like when you go like 10 kilometers down, it changes a lot. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, you know, my problem with the moon, people ask, <laughs> you know, I have the same problem with the moon that Isaac Asimov and Isaac Newton had with the moon. <laughs> yeah. Why is it there? Why is it there? Yeah. <laughs> doing it's what it's doing. It's unlikely. It's, it, by any physics model used to explain it being there by natural causes, no, it makes no sense. You know, the 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 Earth Moon fission theory, pardon me, died of boring. You know, this this cockamamie idea that American quack, quack academics and scientists actually seriously proposed. I remember growing up thinking reading about this, that the moon fissured out of the Earth at a very early stage of, of the development of the planet out of the Pacific Basin and ended up up there doing what it's doing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nonsense. And then, then along came the capture theory, which is my favorite. Yeah. That, you know, we have this... <laughs> By by you know by Earth standards, the, our satellite is an enormous satellite. Yeah. When you when you look at the ratio of the mass of of this biplanetary system, the Earth Moon, and compare the the mass to parent planet ratio of the other satellites in the solar system, it's ridiculous. Well, if you look at if you look at uh, Saturn uh, versus Titan. Right. Exactly. Or if you look at. Uh... Mars, Jupiter, Jupiter and Ganymede, Mars and Phobos, you know. <laughs> no, no, I meant the, uh, Mars as a satellite of, of Krypton or Tiamat. Oh, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Saturn and Titan, I mean, Mars and Titan are about the same size. Right. And the the, the planet that was the third planet, uh, the Saturn-sized water-bearing planet that got blown up, you know, that Mars was exactly the right size for that mass, you know, sort of like Bodhi's law, but right. applied to planetary sizes, right? Right, right. And the moon is like, what, three times the size of, uh, you know, with respect to the Earth of what it yeah. should be? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's an enormous satellite. It's, you know, it's really not a satellite in, in the sense that the others are because we're in a biplanetary system. It's a, bi it's a biplanet system, yeah. Right. But the problem is, how did it get there? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, did it have anti-lock brakes? Well, that's the per, bingo. Precisely, the the capture model makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Because here's this enormous object that supposedly comes careening into the solar system, <laughs> and and then wanders by the Earth and gets captured by our gravity, yeah. and and ends up in a perfectly circular orbit around us. And in such a way that its own axis of rotation is is rotating at a speed that manages to keep 60% of the surface of the moon faced towards the Earth at any given moment. And it's always the same 60%. Wow. That's, you know, and on top of that, it's at exactly the right distance from the planet Earth to blot out the corona of the sun. Exactly. Now, folks... This does not happen by chance. If the moon came in and was captured by the Earth's gravity, the orbit that it would it would be in would be much more elliptical. Right. Like it Mars, has, like Mars's orbit. Like Mars's orbit, exactly. What you said earlier that someone put on the brakes is exactly what happened. Because as as a planet is approaching another planet. And in the capture model, it accelerates. Mm -hmm. As it accelerates in the gravity well, that acceleration it's like a it's like a golf ball going around a, 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 a golf hole. You know, when you putt and miss, it will speed up around the hole and then slow down. So, in other words, the idea that it's in this nearly circular orbit means that as it's approaching the planet Earth to be captured, it's slowing down. 
Yeah. And uh, folks, I, I don't care what you say. This is the reason Isaac Asimov and Isaac Newton had a headache when they thought about the moon. Yeah, flaps thirty, gear down. Yeah, yeah flaps thirty, gear down. You know, <laughs> it's if someone parked it there, folks. That's yeah. what we're saying. So someone parked uh, Iapetus there or Iapetus there as well, right? Oh, I, I absolutely think so. I absolutely think so. You know, Richard Hoagland pointed out that it's at a perfectly Sumerian unit of measure. <laughs> <laughs> well, what does the name Iapetus mean? I know it was a Greek uh, character from the myths, you, you right? Would, you would ask me that, and right off the top of my head, I don't remember. I could probably look it up in the lexicon, but my lexicon's across the room. Well, it sounds to me, and I, this is just pure you know, guessing on my part, that Pettus comes from the same word from Jupiter. Like no. Pettus, like Peter, because the word Peter means Jupiter. No, no. Uh, Petra actually in Greek means rock, but uh, yeah, I, I know I, I read at some point that 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 the, the actual original word behind Peter comes from Jupiter. Well, no, I I I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, technology. interesting. Yeah, well, okay. Well, you know, it's just I'd heard that, so I wanted to bring it up, and uh, we'll just set that aside for the moment. So, so you have the, this pyramidal structure on earth that's a mm -hmm. terror weapon mm -hmm. all right it, mm -hmm. it's just it, it makes anything that we have in our arsenal you know you, you use the expression look like kitchen matches yep right compared to what this thing could do and we, we we're only really scratching the the polished limestone surface of this whole thing Oh yeah, we we haven't even begun to to get into all the detail. And and they found pyramidal structures on the moon as well, haven't they? They have found pyramidal and obelisk like structures on the moon. The Blair Cuspids being the prime example. They have found pyramidal structures all over the surface of Mars, mm -hmm. including a small, a very very small one on on Phobos, the, that weird little moon. Oh one. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the one you, leaking uh, oxygen or water or something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> out. It's outgassing. Yeah, it's outgassing, right? <laughs> you know, which which is another little peculiarity that yeah. no one wants to talk about. Yeah. Um, they have found they have found pyramidal structures, I believe, on the surface of Ganymede, on the surface of Titan. Uh, there are certainly weirdnesses on Iapetus, that that weird moon that you're talking about yeah. around Saturn. Uh, there's, there's, and if I'm not mistaken, I remember seeing some pictures of the planet Mercury a few years ago that appeared to have, you know, again, once again, some of these very strange pyramid like, uh, what were apparently structures of some sort. So who knows? Wow. Um, it does, it does make you think, you know, I, it's a curious feature that you've got all of these pyramids all over the solar system because there is a fellow by the name of Aando Bender who wrote a novel, a science fiction novel <laughs> back in the, get this Kelly, back in the 1930s. And the, the novel's called the puzzle of the space pyramids. I've got a copy of it. And I've read the novel, and you talk about a, a wild yarn, but the 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 novel is all about the fact that human humans are going out and exploring the solar system, and when they land on all these planets, they find all these pyramids. Wow! And they they wonder what the heck are all these pyramids doing here? And you know what his supposition is? What? These were gravity machines that were constructed long ago to put the solar system back in balance because a planet had blown up. Oh, Marduk measured the structure of the deep. Marduk measures the structure of the deep. And I'm reading this and thinking, how in the name of sense does anybody come up with this yeah. in 1930 before anybody's gone out there to look at these planets? Yeah, well, we, we, we can kind of see some of that same sort of hidden occult uh yeah. you know thinking in uh in in the the dog named pluto from disney yes exactly exactly we finally get pictures of pluto and all of a sudden there's the dog <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly 
Yeah. Exact something, you know, in other words, something is going on. There's yeah. there's a there's a memory that is being preserved or tapped into, in my opinion, mm -hmm. probably both. Right. And you know, somebody let me put it differently, Kelly. I've spent most of my alternative research career looking at texts and trying to figure out what they really are saying. And I think somewhere, somebody out there is doing the exact same thing, is looking at texts exactly the same way as, you know, bless his heart, Zechariah Sitchin got everyone started, started doing. But I think it's been going on a lot longer. So was the third, uh, was the third, was the uh, Gulf War the third pyramid war? Oh, boy. <laughs> you would ask that. Um, let, oh, boy. <laughs> I, I, that, that's a breathtaker. I, in, in, short answer, yes. But let, right. me, let me tell you why. When Bush the Stupid decided that he was going to invade Iraq after 9-11, and we were fed that weapons of mass destruction nonsense by uh, General Powell, I think it was, at, at uh, the Disunited Nations Insecurity Council. Um, the first, I have to be honest, when, when, when Powell was up there talking about that, all I could think of was, was Victor Zorin, the old Soviet ambassador during the Cuban Missile Crisis that Adlai Stevenson, uh, you know, was showing the pictures to and demanding that Zorin not wait for the translation, but give an answer to his question. Right. Because the expression on General Powell's face as he's, <laughs> as he's trying to convince everybody about weapons of mass destruction looked exactly like Victor Zorin. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he just, he just looked like he was swallowing a lemon, you know? <laughs> yeah. I would love to see body language goes take a look at that. That oh, video. it was it. Yeah, that it's classic. You can just Powell was just stiff as could be. But anyway, so I, when I heard that, I thought, no, this is this is about weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, but it is not about atomic, biological, or chemical weapons. Right. It's about the ancient stuff, and I I have said as much in numerous footnotes in some of my other books. Uh, particularly with re with respect to the Baghdad Museum looting. Why? Because the Baghdad Museum looting, everyone agrees, was done by somebody who knew exactly where to go and exactly what they were looking for. They already had the inventory, like the tablet. Well, let me let me get to that. the The museum was raided by eyewitnesses who said that American soldiers walked in and came carting out boxes. Now, the problem is anybody can dress up like American soldiers. Yeah. So which the violates the laws of war, but you know, we're which violates the laws of war, but it's, you know, something that anybody can do. Right. Now, the problem is when we went into Iraq, the French and the Germans had archaeological teams all over that country digging things up for Saddam Hussein. Yeah. OK. Supposedly. Supposedly. When we went into Iraq, we gave notice to the French and the Germans to get their archaeological teams the hell out of there because we're coming in and we're going to be coming in, you know, on hot. On hot. And the weapons German free. weapons free, the Germans and the French allegedly evacuated their archaeological teams. However, you have to dig around to find this out. But the German BND, the Bundesnachrichtendienst, the, the, the German CIA, had a lot of on-the-ground presence in Iraq before, during, and after the, the Bush the Stupid invasion. And it was the German magazine Der Spiegel that broke the story wow. of the Baghdad looting. Now, when you add all of it up, what I think happened was the French and the Germans kept the archaeological field catalog of what they had discovered and dug up for Saddam Hussein. 
those field catalogs would have been an inventory of things that were not yet inventoried by the museum itself. Wow. And the interesting thing about the so-called American recovery effort was that if you read Colonel Bogdanovich's book, the recovery effort was limited to the recovery of art objects of art, not cuneiform tablets. Oh, wow. And so you can have the pictures and we'll keep the new rest we'll keep, of the newspaper. Right. The, the, the cuneiform tablets, about 80,000 of them, supposedly, as far as I was able to track the story, which incidentally, nobody else, I, I, I'm dumbfounded to this day that nobody else has really tracked this story thoroughly and written about it. Wasn't there a, an American retail chain that wound up with some of yes, those tablets? Yes, ho Hobby, Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby bought a, a couple of cuneiform tablets that came from the Baghdad looting. Well, Spain ended up with about 80,000 of them. 80,000? 80,000. Spain. Well, Spain, Spain is a, an Spain. interesting connection there. Isn't yeah, it? sure as heck is. Like Madrid yeah. Circular, that kind like of thing? Like Madrid, like Otto Scorzani, <laughs> yeah. German geopolitics. Yes. So, the Spanish-speaking Germans. Yeah, I, I don't know what in the name of sense happened to those to those tablets. But my point here is, is I think we went into Iraq looking for some of that ancient technology, looking for those tablets of destiny, or at least information about where they might be. Yeah. I absolutely think that. Yeah. It's and, intense, you know, you know, maybe somebody, you know, got a copy of what that inventory was and that led well, to let that me, whole thing. Kelly, while we're talking about this, let me crawl out onto the twig of speculation <laughs> once right. again. Right. To, it's, a, to, it's a long twig. It's a very long twig because I want people to clue in what I think may have been going on and why I've said certain things uh, in, in those books and why I said certain things in later books. Um, the Tablets of Destinies in Sitchin's reconstruction of his texts, he maintains were light-emitting crystals. Now, if you are a gemologist, if you are like me, fascinated with gems, you know, I have, you know, just to show you how fascinated I am, I have little crystals and acrylic versions of gemstones scattered all over my house because I just like looking at them. Mm -hmm. I think they're pretty. Yeah. But if you study, if you study gemstones, you know, think think of the Hope Diamond or or the Great Mogul Diamond or you know some of these famous gemstones, the the Kohinoor in the British uh, Crown Jewels and so on and so forth. If you study the lore of these things, you'll find out something very interesting, and particularly lore from India, where they find many of these large diamonds and and rubies and right. sapphires and so on. The lore goes back centuries. That's number one. And number two, the lore contains countless wars fought to possess particular gemstones. Wow. Wow. So what I think is going on here is that this ultimately is coming out of Sitchin's read on the Tablets of Destiny that this is a yet another legacy memory of, of a technology that existed in crystalline form and that gave its possessors great power. Well, and look, look, look at what the phase lock loop crystal circuit did for radio. Exactly. Exactly. You, you cannot have modern technology without crystals, mm -hmm. you know, computer chips. What are yeah. they? Well, they're crystals. Yeah. Radio. What are, what are they? Crystals. What's what's the modern flat screen television? Liquid crystal. Wow. You know, on and on we could go. So I think I, I definitely think that that my idea of of 
you know, crystals with such peculiar refractive properties that they can literally trap light and create a singularity. And that means, therefore, a gravitational concentration or anomaly that this is something uh, that you would spend a great deal of money to possess or a great be- deal of other kinds of treasure, including blood to, yeah. to possess. Well, that gets back to Gabriel Crone and his yes. discovery of uh, general relativity effects in electrical networks as well. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. Have you read the study of Crone's work that was edited by Banish Hoffman? Yeah, I have read that, yeah. Do you remember in that book where they are reviewing Crone's thinking about crystals? I don't recall that specific part, but... Oh, yeah. there he, Crone, <laughs> Crone was absolutely, once again, on the idea that, that crystals could be tremendously powerful and efficient means of information and power storage. Absolutely. So how is that related to alchemy? Okay, the the original name of Egypt in in ancient Egyptian documents is alchem. Yeah. From which we get alchemy. Mm-hmm. The science of transmutation of elements. And if you look at the Egyptian religion, the Egyptians believed in something called mat, okay? We would call it the quintessence or primal matter, okay? In other words... The the ether, what's underneath the Dirac Sea. Right, the ether, what's under the Dirac Sea, or another word for it would be philosopher's stone. Or another another word for it from from George Lucas would be the force. Right. Okay? It's the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Egyptians had this highly unified understanding of science and religion and philosophy. For them, it was all kind of one thing. It really is. And yeah, it really is. And the the word for Cairo, you mentioned that earlier in our discussion. Mm-hmm. Al Cairo is the name of Cairo. What does it mean? It means Mars. It means Mars. Why is the capital of Egypt named after the red planet? And why, of all planets in the solar system, the planet associated with war? Right next to the the, the great war, weapon of terror. Right, right next. Well, right next to the Great Pyramid. And what's what's the Arabic name for the Sphinx? The Arabic name for the Sphinx is Abu Hol. And what does that name mean? Lord of Terrors, right? Fa- Father of Terrors. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So why this Why this association? In- well, Hoagland said that, uh, Richard Hoagland said that uh, we are the Martians. Oh, yeah. I think I think he's definitely on to something. Because the, I think it's the Zulu tribe in, in Southern Africa maintains that, yeah, we come from Mars. We come from that planet. And by the way, we got here on Amerikaba. Which is odd because that's the Zulu word for a ship, and it's also <laughs> it's also the Hebrew word for a ship. Oh wow! <laughs> yes. Well, you know, I always found it wild in the in the Noah in the you know the the narrative about Noah and the flood was that you know they covered the ship in bitumen. That sounds like stealth technology to me. It's and, not. It's not only that, but but you know. I, I've always had this crazy notion that the Ark was not this big ship full of full of animals that you're cleaning up poop all the time from. <laughs> uh, I've had I've had this. <laughs> you've got to admit it's it's a task that's way beyond eight people. So. Yeah, well, there's no problem with the food supply, but it probably stunk <laughs> like heaven, right? Well, well, yeah. I mean, you know, t- taking a boatload of giraffes and lions is probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but I have no difficulty with the idea being that these are DNA samples, right? In cultures, that means you're dealing with a much smaller boat. You're dealing with something that's feasible. You're dealing with something that's obviously technological, like Bill Gates's little island up in uh, northern Europe. Ding ding ding, yeah, ding ding ding. Bill's Ark. Yeah, Bill's Ark. Yeah, it's it's not an impossibility. Uh, 
Yeah, and, they, and he sent out Doves. You know, maybe Dove was the brand name of the drone they sent out to Surrey <laughs> the Earth. Yeah, you know, who knows? <laughs> right. Who knows? Uh, there's there's all sorts of ways to to uh, rationalize what's going on. My my only caution to people is don't don't let this over rationalize to the extent that you rule out God. Uh, that's the mistake that most people make with with thinking this way. I'm I'm not trying to do all of this to try and paint the picture that I don't believe that the theological aspects of these old stories is untrue. Uh, I I think I think quite the opposite. Well, actually, you know, if you if you take the Tiller model in Acts of Conscious Creation, right? Uh, William Tiller was a a scientist at UCLA who did experiments where uh where meditators accomplished meditators could change physical matter with their meditations yeah the, and, and, and change living systems but the yeah. way he described it in his equations because I actually read through the equations mm -hmm. uh was they had two coordinate frames mm -hmm. he had a, a a regular coordinate frame you know x y and z like a cartesian frame mm -hmm. and then he described a, a, a cartesian frame prime and and that the the spiritual realms were defined in this prime mm -hmm. uh, thing, and it was the blend of these two things that was the with the template of action. I, I yeah i i think I think that there's definitely a an ultra fine medium or ether. Right. Um, in fact, I'm I'm more certain of it now than I've ever been before, and I do also think that that medium explains certain types of things present in the the lore and tradition of, of ancient societies and sure. cultures. Um, I do not think that this is an explanation that can get rid of uh, the transcendent or the via negativa or whatever you wish to call it. I don't think that at all. Um, I think... I think there's a great danger in in that kind of materialistic philosophy. Right, right. Well, Buddhism describes the middle way. Yeah, this is this is what we need. Is we need we need a non-binary frame of mind. Right. And that there, you know, I'm constantly trying to tell people you need to start thinking both and rather than either or. And right. Part of that both and thinking is is precisely as you say. It's partly thinking in th terms of threes and not twos. But <laughs> right, right. Well, that's why the show is called the Common Surface. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's exactly. about the connections. If you look at reality carefully, you'll notice that there are many, many more connections between things than there are distinctions. Right. Right. So right. we've been we've been. We've been studying the trees and not seeing the forests. But in order to have connections, what must you first have? Distinction. Right. Right. In order to have distinction, you have to have commonality as a base. That's right, too. Yeah. Right. So it's uh, we're two hours and 13 minutes in, and uh, I just wonder if there's anything you want to throw in there before we uh, we wrap it up for this. No, I think I think we're good to wrap up. We'll probably both think of things that we yeah need to talk about in this respect down the line. But I think that's a pretty good place to end it. Yeah. So how do how do people you know tell me a little bit just in a few minutes we have left. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the Giza community. Well, my website is uh, it, it kind of evolved. It was certainly not anything that. I designed to be this way, but it's evolved into this kind of, uh, for want of a better expression, a, a website driven discussion group of people that we get together every two weeks for members vid chats. You have to be a paying subscriber to participate in them, but they're a lot of fun because we have, uh, we have a very, very diverse group of people. Um, we've got atheists, we've got agnostics, we've got Buddhists, we've got, we've got bureau Brussels bureaucrats in the EU, we've got healthcare, you know, it's, it's a very diverse group of people. And 
we just discuss everything and anything, you know, and our one rule is it has to be intelligent. And our second rule is it has to be courteous. But other than that, you know, people, people weigh in with their comments and questions and, and we just, we just sit around and discuss all of this stuff. Um, yeah. So it's kind of like a, uh, like a, uh, a community of, of people that are one of their explorers. It's a it's a coffee shop on the internet. Yeah. If you're used to having those kinds of deep coffee shop discussions uh with people, that's that's what that's what the, it is. Um, yeah, we used to sit around and do that as kids, but people don't really do that anymore. No, they don't, sadly to say. And and I wish they did. But uh it, it's kind of that sort of thing and it's it's kind of driven. It's also a community of people that submits Every article that I blog about on my website, uh, and this this began years ago, but every article that I blog about on my website is is an article that someone has sent to me. Yeah, so it's sort of like private membership, uh, open source intelligence. Right. It's you know right. It's a community driven website, quite yeah. literally. I, I'm sort of the moderator. <laughs> right. So the so the the URL for that is is Giza Death Star dot com. Dot com. Right. Right. And, 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 you know, we, I also noticed that your now that your books, have, your first three books, the trilogy has been released from copyright. Mm -hmm. uh, Walter Bosley's publishing those. But if you right. go on to Lulu and you search for Joseph P. Farrell, they don't come up. So I had to go search on the Internet to well, find that on Lulu. So what is uh, what is the name of his publishing company? Corvus, C-O-R-V-I-S, Corvus. Yeah. So you find them if you type in Giza Death Star. You can also find them on my website. Just look for the look for the pictures of the covers, and it will take you right to Lulu to order them. And if you haven't read these books, you know we got into some very technical stuff on this particular phone call. But for you know for the audience, you know if you haven't availed yourself of the original book, uh, the Giza that you know Death Star book, uh, it is an entry into a fascinating way to look at reality yeah. uh, and it's respectful of faith and also respectful of, you know, our, our common experience. And so I highly encourage you to go there and, and get those books and check them out because we need to keep Joseph, uh, you know, fed and happy and his dog fed and happy. So, <laughs> so we, uh, so we can, uh, you know, continue the, the, this amazing conversation that he's had with the world for over two decades now. So I want to thank you, Joseph, for being on The Common Surface and look forward to talking to you again. Yep. Thank you for having me on, Kelly.